Released in 1990 for the Nintendo Entertainment System, courtesy of Acclaim Entertainment and Imagineering Incorporated, Destination Earth Star is a space flight simulator thing where you go about shooting down alien ships that look somewhat like those Tiderian shuttles from Star Wars. Your main goal in these sections is to seek out the enemy targets with the aid of your navigational map and kill them all. All the while visiting planets to stock up on weapons, energy, and provide repairs for your ship. Once all enemies are cleared from the sector, you head on over to the enemy base where the game shifts to a traditional 2D side-scrolling shooter that's more of a chore to play than any semblance of a true challenge. Navigate the caverns, pick up some upgrades, and reach the end boss. Defeat the boss to clear the level, and then you're back on the space sim portion, which takes place in the brand new sector filled with more bad guys and all that stuff where you get to do the whole thing all over again. Now, if that doesn't sound like an exciting premise for a Nintendo game pack, then I don't know what is. Destination Earth Star is somewhat ambitious in its premise, not just trying to make a space simulator on the NES, which is pretty ambitious in its own right, but also combining two different genres into one game and trying to make it all work. And at the risk of sounding cliche, because it comes from Acclaim Entertainment, there's no need to mention that it doesn't quite work. But I think in this case, there's no need to bring up Acclaim Entertainment in order to mention that Destination Earth Star doesn't quite work. It has an interesting idea going for it, and there's bits of it that I like about the game, but on a whole, it's a failed experiment if nothing else, but let's dig a little deeper. When you begin a game of Destination Earth Star, you start off in the cockpit of your Earth ship. The general goal here is simple, using your navigational grid on the left, you have to track down enemy ships indicated by the numbers on the grid and destroy them. Now the premise seems somewhat simplistic, and it is, don't get me wrong. However, there is a bit of resource management at play here. While you have a regular complement of ruby laser cannons and torpedoes to do away with your enemies, as you get through the campaign, these eventually run out and dry up. So you have to visit planets and achieve orbit to seek out whatever resources they may have, whether it be ammo replacement, some ship repair, or even a boost of energy to keep your ship running a little while longer. Each sector of space you visit also has an armory planet that restocks all your weapons, as well as a base that replenishes your energy reserves and restores your vessel to pristine condition, but you can only visit these once per sector to take advantage of their services, so to speak. So you'll have to be careful and manage your resources wisely or else you'll meet an early demise. Control is something that feels clunky at first because Imagineering tried to cram in as much as they could in one little NES gamepad. Basic commands include pressing the A button to shoot things, start button selects your weapons, and select alters your heads up display, but pressing the B button in conjunction with other th buttons allows you to change viewpoints to see your surroundings, as well as changing the speed of your ship, as well as making the jump to hyperspace, which allows you to traverse a good portion of the sector at the cost of energy. Like I said, there's quite a bit of stuff to work with, and they did the best they could with what little they had in terms of buttons. And at first, trying to make sense of all these controls might seem off-putting, but if you start the game up, you don't press any of the buttons, you wait through the credits. The game tells you exactly what buttons and combination of buttons does what in the briefest of terms, so you had that kind of in-game help if you really needed it. And really, once you get a grasp on the controls, the game doesn't feel as clunky. But it's still fairly clunky nonetheless. Your ship is not the most maneuverable vessel ever conceived. It is slow, cumbersome, a somewhat clunky piece of machinery. Did I mention how clunky your ship is? I might have mentioned that a couple of times. In contrast, your enemy's Tiderian gunboat thing is fast, agile, and able to ram torpedoes up your tailpipe faster than you could make another tired Jar Jar Abrams joke. And while clearing sectors will net you additional weapons, such as homing torpedoes and another type of laser, there's nothing in the sense of slight engine tweaks or whatever the case may be that could improve overall ship performance. I suppose this could be due to hardware limitations, but honestly, there have been flight sims on the NES that felt a little more swift for lack of a better term. Still, despite the somewhat sluggish nature of the space simulator portion, there's a part of me that really dug what Destination Earth Star was trying to achieve here. I could go about exploring planets and blowing up shuttles every so often and still get a kick out of it. It's a purely guilty pleasure on my part, and I feel if they had spent more time polishing this part and less time adding unnecessary tripe to the game, this could have been somewhat decent. At least I'd like to think so. Ah, but speaking of unnecessary tripe, there's the other half of Destination Earth Star. Once you clear all the aliens in the sector, the enemy headquarters will reveal itself and you can now begin your attack run. At this point, the game switches to a 2D side-scrolling space shooter format where you navigate the maze-like enemy base. 
Essentially, you fly through the level, destroying enemies as well as bits of scenery for some reason, and collecting pickups which grants your ship different weapons that not only shoot forwards, but also backwards. And in a particularly nice touch, you could switch weapons while the game is paused. In any event, you reach the end of the level, you destroy the boss or bosses, and move on to the next sector where you're back in the cockpit doing the same thing as before, only with more aliens to destroy. Now, if you thought control over your ship in the shooter segments was going to be an improvement over the space sim segments, then you seem to forget whose name appears on the cover of this game because the control in the shooter segments doesn't quite work. If anything, it makes your ship even more cumbersome to control. So check this out. In any traditional scrolling shooter like a Gradius or an R-Type or that sort of game, you use the D-pad to move your spaceship in all eight directions. Fairly straightforward, easy to move around, even if your ship is slow as molasses. Destination Earth Star doesn't work like that. See, you can move your ship freely up and down, but horizontal movement? Oh, that's the killer. See, if you press left or right on the D-pad, even just a light tap, your ship will shift from one invisible track to another. Basically, the idea is that the screen has three lanes, for lack of a better term, and these lanes not only determine your horizontal position, but they also determine how fast you scroll through the level. So if you're on the left side of the screen, you fly slowly. If you're on the right side of the screen, you fly fast and can't see what's coming up. And if you think you could just stay in the back and take your sweet-ass time through the level, then you leave yourself open to attacks from behind. Now, as mentioned, the game remedies this by giving you weapons that fires both forwards and backwards, and you could hold the buttons down for rapid fire, which is nice. But if you fire too much of a weapon, the other weapon doesn't work. So no holding down both buttons for a barrage of protective fire here, it simply doesn't work that way. And unlike the space sim portions where you could take multiple hits before being destroyed, one hit from anything kills you. Oh, you have multiple lives in these segments and you could always collect more, but Going from a heavily armored spaceship to what's essentially a flying confetti egg that bursts in a single hit? That's pretty damn stupid. Oh, and once you lose all your lives, it's game over. No continues, no passwords, no battery backup, no nothing. There is, however, a level skip code you could input with the second player controller, but ultimately, later sectors are just more of the same. To be perfectly honest, I feel like the shmup sections are somewhat superfluous. They feel tacked on the product as if they are just there for the sake of being there, it doesn't really add anything to the overall experience of Destination Earth Star. This easily could have been its own game, albeit one that's a little rough and dodgy and kind of rubbish, but its own game nonetheless. It didn't need to be part of this game. Drop the shmup bits and you'd have enough memory on the card to do some interesting things with the space sim stuff, which is the only real interesting aspect of Destination Earth Star, even if it is somewhat flawed in its execution. When it comes to the graphics of Destination Earth Star, there are a couple of highlights. I like the hyperspace effect that takes place, a simple but neat visual. I like the overall design of the cockpit with all the useless doohickeys and thingamabobs laying about, all the while giving you a couple of displays for your various stats, your radar, and very straightforward ship strength indicator. The star field's nicely done. Aside from those bits though, Destination Earth Star looks a bit on the bland side for lack of a better term. Scaling of objects is understandably not the greatest. The planets look all the same, more or less, with different colors. And I'm not quite thrilled with the overuse of blue here, but on a whole, this looks adequate. You could call it a messy display, but they tried, and in that regard, it's fine for what it is, even if it isn't really much. The shooter segments, on the other hand, isn't too great looking. All the levels look the same with minor color changes. Everything is either a dark blue or some other drab color. This is not the most appealing thing to look at here. And the flicker that occurs is absolute murder here. So yeah. Destination Earth Star has two pieces of music in the entire game. One that plays during the simulation bits and one that plays during the shooter bits. And that's it. There's an attempt to convey a somewhat orchestral, majestic feel to the thing or somewhat befitting an epic space adventure, but instead it just feels like two songs that loop constantly and are stuck with you for the duration of your game. And after a good while, they do start to feel really repetitive. Now, if you pause the game, done by pressing B and A at the same time during the space sim segments, or pressing start during the shooter segments, don't ask, you can mute the music when you unpause, but try not to pause again or else you'll turn it back on again. It doesn't quite work as well, much like a lot of the game actually. Sound effects are minimal, stock NES quality sounds, not much to say there. Destination Earth Star is not a good game, and this is a game I actually liked as a kid because it was sort of a space sim thing on the NES, and that was kind of a cool thing at the time. And even playing it today, the space simulator portions are actually my favorite aspect of Destination Earth Star, even if the execution leaves much to be desired. But I think that's more due to my liking the idea that the game was trying to convey more than the actual game itself. 
the controls, the mechanics, the execution of the simulator parts are not of the highest standards. The shooter segments feel superfluous, rough, and actually takes away from the overall experience. If Imagineering dropped the shmup section and focused on making the sim aspect worth a damn, this could have been a decent little space sim game on the NES. Probably wouldn't have been great or even good, but it'd be a little more than what we have here. As it is, Destination Earth Star veers off course into an endless void and is only worth sampling if you're into quirky, oddball NES titles that try but fail miserably. At the very least, it's somewhat cheap, so that's something. <laughs>